This is the first video ever of metallic water. Now, in principle, if you just get regular water and squeeze it hard enough, like in the core of a larger planet or a star, eventually it'll become metallic. Sadly, that's probably beyond the price point of this video or the entire of mankind. So how did we do it here? Well, metals don't typically dissolve in most liquids, but some do. Alkali metals will dissolve in liquid ammonia, which starts at about minus 30 degrees Celsius, that sort of thing. And when they do, they give these incredible blue solutions that are actually due to the dissolved electrons. Yeah, that blue color there is actually just electrons sat there in ammonia. And obviously there are some metal ions in there to keep it all electro neutral. But at very high concentrations, something incredible happens. You get these immaculate gold solutions. It's still just a solution of metal in ammonia, but it looks amazing. Metallic ammonia is just one of the weirdest things in the universe. It's completely unexpected and completely beautiful. Now, metallic water, well, no one's ever seen that before. You know, these alkali metals and water, eh, they, they, they tend to get fairly excited together. That is, of course, until now. You are the first generation of humans to ever see this. And yeah, this is actually in part thanks to YouTube. And it's just been published in Nature. So that's what it looks like directly at the needle. So how do we make this metallic water without it exploding? And how do we know this is metallic water like this was metallic ammonia? And how will this amazing discovery revolutionize mankind? Well, that's a fascinating story. And it starts with the universe. See, the universe is made up of atoms that's positively charged nuclei and electrons stuck to them in this sort of electrostatic well. Now, sometimes those nuclei can share these skittish little electrons to form molecules. And yeah, this is what makes up you, me, them, and the rest of most of the physical universe. And it's a lot closer than you think, right down to the air you're breathing at the moment. Now, hydrogen is the most common element in the universe by a long way. So it turns out the most common molecules in the universe are the hydrides of the heavier nuclei with two of the most common being the hydrides of oxygen, which is water, and the hydride of nitrogen, which is ammonia. Now, those molecules are fairly polar, which basically means the electrons aren't shared evenly between the nuclei of the molecule, which means that it's sort of, you know, it's, it's a bit like a magnet. It's got positively charged bits and negatively charged bits, whilst being overall neutral. Again, it's not that far away. This is the water molecule, H2O, that makes up most of your body. Now, this means that it's actually pretty good at dissolving polar things like ions, which is why salt dissolves in water. It's also why things like sugars dissolve fairly well in water. And of course, it's fairly critical for biochemistry, uh, which is why most of your body is water. Well, just like these polar molecules are fairly good for dissolving ions, it turns out some of them have this really bizarre property that they'll dissolve electrons too. You see, electrons are almost universally found in cavities where there's a nucleus in the middle, a atom. But liquid ammonia is just the right polarity in which you can create these cavities in which electrons are stable without a nucleus. Now, there's just an electron sat there in the middle and the molecules point all their polar bits in towards that electron to stabilize it. Now, when you do this with liquid ammonia, those solutions can be stable for an awful long time, you know, weeks to months, that sort of thing, but will slowly react away. When you do this with water, there's a problem. Solvated electrons in water don't last long. They last for microseconds before those cavities collapse and the electrons react with the water molecule and release quite a lot of energy. So it was that one Pablo Youngworth came to me with a really good idea. Seeing as we together had had all this success measuring the photoelectron spectrum of solvated electrons in ammonia, he said, yeah, why don't we do that with water? And my response was fairly quick and simple. 
Yeah, that's impossible. I mean, firstly, solvated electrons in water last for about a microsecond, and when they do react with water, they release about as much energy as rocket fuel. It's a bomb. Add to this the fact that photoelectron spectra require quite high vacuums. I mean, let's just say I can perform the miracle and get two streams of, say, sodium-potassium alloy in water to stably react in a vacuum chamber. What you've essentially got there is a hypergolic rocket engine. There's no way you could maintain a vacuum while doing this. So sure, I knew it was impossible, he knew it was impossible, but whatever, we decided to give it a go. After all, even if you fail, you still might discover something interesting. If nothing else, you would get this really cool microjet rocket engine that burns sodium potassium alloy and water out at the end of it, which would look really cool. Yeah, no, nah, nah, maybe we'd have some interesting spin-offs like, I don't know, solving global warming or something. I don't know. Who knows where it's going to go with research? So the first step was to make a liquid metal microjet. Well, that turned out to be fairly simple. We'd made these microjet nozzles before, and it turns out they ran liquid metals quite well. Then, months later, it suddenly occurs to us, hang on, what if we just let a little bit of water vapor in there? I mean, why are we making a rocket engine here? You know, mixing roughly equal amounts of sodium potassium alloy and water. Why don't we just add a small amount of water and watch the reaction on the surface of the metal? I know it sounds like such an obvious idea, but newsflash, even people who you might think of as smart, or hell, even groups of them can miss things that are really simple. I mean, there's only two things you should know about research. Firstly, it wouldn't be called research if we knew what we were doing. And secondly, the non-obvious is always obvious when you know what the answer is. With maybe one of the clearest examples being Newton, held as a genius for two of his laws of motion, which are, if you don't do anything to it, nothing happens, and the harder you shove it, the faster it moves. But he was the first human of billions to actually work that out and write it down. Yeah, the obvious is always obvious with hindsight. So yeah, a few months after we started this uh, research, it took a very obvious different direction. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get water molecules to hit a surface here, and then, we have a chance of seeing the metallic water. But how much water do you need to add? Well, let's start by roughly what you're breathing at the moment, which is air at about one atmosphere. Now, what you're looking at here is really, really small and really, really slow. You're looking at something that's about a billionth of a meter in size and a billionth of a second in time scale. The molecules that you're looking at there in reality are traveling at about the speed of sound. And if you want to know how these things are generated, it's a fairly simple physics engine based on uh, the ever complicated Newtonian laws of motion, combined with a bit of electrostatics, and boom, you have a molecular dynamics simulation of, in this case, the air that you're currently breathing, which is about 80% nitrogen, those are the blue ones, 20% oxygen, the red ones, and if it's 100% humidity on a fairly warm day, about 2% of the air that you're breathing is water. Now, one atmosphere is one bar of pressure, a thousand millibars. So 2% of that equates to about 20 millibar. Alternatively, if I just delete all of the air, which you can do quite easily in a simulation like this, what you have left is 20 millibar vapor pressure of water. Dimensions time. So that's about a one litre pop bottle. Now, obviously, if I put this in a vacuum, it'll just collapse, but just say it didn't for sake of argument, and I can suck all of the air out of this so it's this perfect vacuum and screw on the lid. How much water would need to be dropped in there for it all to evaporate and give me a saturated vapor pressure of water? It turns out it's about a single drop of water. Single drop of water, so that's about 20 milligrams, a single drop of water. Yeah, but uh, well, whatever, Let, let's chop that down from a single drop of water to a 20th of a drop of water, about one milligram, which is now going to give us a vapor pressure of water in our one liter pot bottle of about a millibar, a thousandth of an atmosphere. Yeah, that's the pressure that they're planning to run the Hyperloop on. Now that's actually a fairly accessible vacuum in most labs. Right, so what I'm gonna do is open it up to the full vacuum and you'll see roughly how quickly it pumps down. 
So, yeah, it's a big pump going on a fairly small system, but even at that, you can see that it really slows down once you get down to millibar type pressures. Yeah, that's kind of cute, but it turns out in order to get the metallic water, we needed to reduce the pressure in this system by a factor of about a million. That is, this is roughly the density of water for millibar type pressures. We need to get to a millionth of a millibar type pressures. Well, that can be done, but it requires some fairly specialized kit like uh, turbo pumps or diffusion pumps. Now, diffusion pumps, I should do a video on sometime because they have fascinating little beasties with no moving parts, yet they'll quite happily get down to vacuum levels of a millionth of a millibar. And of course, we need some alkali metal to react this water with. Now, in this case, we want it to be liquid so we can drop it into the vacuum. So the one that we use is sodium potassium alloy. So if you roughly get an equal mixture of sodium and potassium and mix them together, what you end up with is something that's a liquid at room temperature called sodium potassium alloy. Now, if we drop this into an atmosphere that contains oxygen, then the sodium potassium alloy reacts with that to make sodium oxide, potassium oxide, that sort of thing, which almost immediately forms a skin on the surface of the metal. So it's one of the ways that we know we've got a very good vacuum in there is when we have it dropping into the vacuum chamber and there's no skin formed on this whatsoever. You just get this immaculately clean metal surface. Okay, so the vacuum is currently at seven to the minus six. And let some water in there. So there you heard me calling out the vacuum in the system as about seven millionths of a millibar. Now I'm going to use a needle valve to add an absolute minuscule amount of water to this to increase the vapor pressure of water to about 70 millionths of a millibar. And there you go. This is five, uh, seven to the minus, eight to the minus five. And that's what it looks like on the screen. Okay, that's about five to the minus five on the vacuum. As you can see, it's it's quite busy around a single drop of uh, stuff. Now, that's actually quite technically challenging. Uh, the more so, seeing as we didn't actually know the conditions for doing this experiment before we started. Thankfully, I'm actually fairly well resourced for this sort of thing, thanks to having a lot of very generous patrons. Indeed, I had to fight to get the support of this channel into the acknowledgement of the paper. Eh, mostly because I don't think the journal quite fully appreciated just how virtually everything involved in this part of the experiment, virtually every part of it was accumulated through the people who support this channel, including things like the uh, diffusion pump and the high vacuum gauges, which are actually pretty expensive. And so it turns out I could just put a piece of kit together like this from what I had lying around. So what does it look like when it's working? Well, bloody amazing. I mean, it's uh, fairly variable, but you know, the general features are always there that it starts off yellow, then sort of transitions to purple, and then you get the most amazing color show at the end. Now comes the challenging bit. You've got a drop, about the size of a drop of water, and to convince people that that is actually metallic water you've got there, you've got to at least measure the spectrum of it. So in order to do that, you've got to focus a spectrometer probe on a small area of the droplet and take a background spectrum. And then when you have the drop come through, you measure the reflectance spectrum and you see at first it absorbs in the blue part of the spectrum and then that migrates over to the red part of the spectrum as it turns bluer, which is pretty much what you see with solvated electrons in ammonia. Apart from there is no ammonia here, only water vapor. You see, you might remember from earlier when we had very high concentrations of electrons in ammonia, it was golden. And then as it progressively diluted, it slowly turned blue. Well, when the water first gets onto the surface here, of course, you're getting very high concentrations, these solvated electrons. Sure, they don't live long, but you have an entire reservoir of extra electrons below it. And as more water gets added, it gets more diluted. Then something very weird happens, which we... Yeah, still don't have a great explanation for, it goes all trippy, which we reckon is probably some sort of thin film artifact similar to what you get with oil on a road. So because we know the vacuum level, we can calculate how thick the layer is 
on the surface of these droplets at various times. And by the time we're getting these trippy patterns, the thickness of that layer is about a micron. Human hairs for reference are about 100 microns. But one micron is give or take the wavelength of visible light. And that's about when you start getting interference patterns. However, my colleagues were keen to get the photo electron spectrum of this. You know, because there's one real way to show that this is actually uh, solvated electrons here, and that's the photoelectron spectra, which is even more complicated stuff because, I mean, just regarding the spectrum, these things is tough enough. But to actually get the photoelectron spectra, you've got to blast that thing with an X ray beam from a synchrotron about a millimeter in size, then get the electrons you knock off to go through a hole about a millimeter in size. And if it looks like there was a whole army of people involved, it's because there were. This was a big part of what convinced the referees that this was indeed a metallic water solution. And when you hear the original audio to this, you might get some fairly strong, um, yeah, we wouldn't call it research if we knew what we were doing vibes. Look at this. <laughs> Look at the colours! Look at the colours! Oh, it's gold and purple! <laughs> it was different this time. Nothing, we just decided that we were going to give up and try something else. <laughs> so, is any of this of any use whatsoever? Well, not a lot springs to mind, but science can often be odd like this. Things that look like they're virtually useless can turn out to be really important. Like say, for instance, this weird property of, of semiconductors, like transistors, which at the time was some weird semiconductor behavior, turned out to be the basis of all world computing. Or yeah, likewise, it could just turn out to be utterly useless, which let's be honest, is the great preponderance of discoveries. But even if it is utterly useless, my God, is it beautiful. So if you enjoyed the first views of metallic water, give the video a thumbs up and maybe consider supporting the channel. And if you're really into this, I'll shortly be putting up a couple of very in-depth videos on my second channel, The Voice of Thunder, where I'll detail how I made these kits and ran the experiments. And uh, as ever, thanks for watching.